Welcome, everyone. So this is uh, one of our free public lectures that are held by Caltech Astronomy once a month. Um, thank you for uh, attending. We have the full schedule for the whole semester. There are two more this semester. Um, and then we'll put together another one for the spring. Uh, it, it's available on the table just outside the door. <laughs> on the other side of the flyer, we also have our schedule of astronomy on tap events, which are uh, similar to this, but less formal and in a bar. So we have in Old Town Pasadena, you can go. Our next one is actually especially for uh, the event of this week that Monsi is going to be talking about. Um, two, two people involved with the, two or three people involved with the, the discovery are going to be giving short 10 to 15 minute informal talks at a bar in Old Town Pasadena. And there's beer. I mean, we don't pay for your beer. But, um, <laughs> but, we, but the talks are free. And you're welcome to drink whilst listening to the talks and interact with the astronomers involved in the discovery and interact with, uh, with a variety of astronomers who are there. So uh, it's on Monday. And it's uh, usually once a month on Mondays. It's on the back side of the flyer, the schedule for that. Um, but there's a special one that is not on this flyer that's next week. We, we made it special because of the special nature of the event that was announced this week, which we'll hear more about. Uh, but it is on our website if you go to the website at the bottom of the, the flyer. Um, so just a, a heads up as to what's going to happen tonight. Um, after I'm done uh, doing announcements, we'll have our, our talk from our esteemed speaker. And then there will be Q&A briefly afterwards. And then I encourage you guys either to stick around in here. We'll have a table set up with a panel, expert panel Q&A, where you can ask questions about astronomy or physics or the nature of the discovery from members of the teams that were involved. We have one of the LIGO team members who will be able to answer questions about gravitational waves and the discovery in that aspect of things. We have a member of the, the, the Carnegie Swope team that made the optical discovery. Uh, we'll have members of Monsi's team here. And Monsi may remain around to answer questions as well. I'll be here to answer other questions that aren't related to this discovery that may be related to astrophysics and galaxies. Um, there will be a variety of us to answer your questions. And uh, at the same time, we'll have telescopes set up on the field just behind us. Um, they're setting them up now. Uh, there's some clouds in the sky, but we're going to do our best to see things. It's hopeful that we'll be able to see the double cluster Andromeda galaxy Albireo, which is a really cool, uh, colorful binary star. And I don't know, maybe the Ring Nebula, maybe M13, I'm not sure. But uh, go check it out. And you're encouraged to go back and forth. So if you get tired of the telescopes or you get tired of us talking, you can go back and forth. Uh, yeah, so that's the schedule for this evening. And I think those are all my announcements. Oh, and when you use the field, please, I've been instructed very explicitly by the athletics department, uh, no food, water, trash, smoking, litter, pets, and especially no things that could damage the artificial turf, like high heels um, or canes, that you can puncture the artificial turf. If we have problems, then we'd never get to use the fields for our telescopes again. So please, uh, it's a nice evening. You can take off the high heels and just walk barefoot out there. Um, but please obey those rules, or we don't get to use the field anymore either. Uh, OK, so enough with me talking. Uh, our speaker for this evening is Dr. Monsi Kosliwal. She's a professor here in the department. She um, did her, undergra or her, yes, her undergraduate studies at Cornell, her graduate work here at Caltech. When she finished, she went up, up across town. There's a really esteemed astronomical observatory uh, called the Carnegie Observatories that's um, north of the 210. She worked as a postdoc there. And then she came back two years ago and began as a faculty member. So she's going to talk to us now about the amazing discovery that was announced earlier this week. So please welcome Dr. Monsi Kosselwa. All right, a very good evening to all of you. Uh, I am, uh, thank you to Cameron for organizing these, uh, this lovely stargazing lecture series. Um, so what I'd like to tell you about today are cosmic fireworks. So all of you, I assume, have seen fireworks on 4th of July, right? So the word fireworks is no mystery. Cosmic is the prefix that we, we want to focus on today. So what I'll be telling you about are, are flashes of light in the night sky that are between a million to, to several billion times as bright as our sun. It's just one star or two stars, but they get much, much brighter, millions to billions of times brighter than our sun for a very short amount of time. So maybe a few seconds, maybe a few days, maybe a few months, but that's about it. 
So they're ephemeral and energetic flashes of light that adorn our night sky. So the sky that you see outside is not the same every day. Our universe is a beautiful, dynamic place. And today I'm going to tell you about just one fireworks display. And I have to admit, this is the most spectacular fireworks display in my scientific career so far. And I'm going to, going to tell you about the fireworks display that began in the morning of August 17th, 2017. So the, the morning started off as a completely ordinary morning. I woke up, brushed my teeth. You saw my two-year-old running around earlier to cook some lunch for him. And then at around 7 a.m., right, you know, a minute after my two-year-old had woken up, my phone rang. And this was an automated phone call from uh, my software. And this was an alert from the LIGO Virgo Consortium. This has happened before, no big deal. We know what to do, we know the drill. But so far, the alert has always said that there are two black holes smashing into each other. And black holes are great, but black holes are black, right? So not much light from them. So, but this time, this phone call on August 17, 2017 was very special. It said that two neutron stars had merged. So what happened next? My two-year-old learned a new word early in the morning. He calls it neutron star. He can't quite say new just yet. Uh, but he had to promptly be handed to daddy because mommy had to get to work. There was no time to lose there. <laughs> so what you see here is uh, the gravitational wave signal from LIGO Hanford, LIGO Livingston. And no, there really is nothing here in the Virgo plot. It's not just your eyes. But this chirp, the signal here, is what all the excitement was about. This is what told you that two, uh, two neutron stars had merged and emitted gravitational waves. To add to the excitement, 1.7 seconds later, there was a flash of gamma rays, a burst of gamma rays detected by the Fermi satellite, NASA satellite in space, and then uh, shortly after by the integral satellite as well. So there was actually light. Gamma rays are electromagnetic radiation. So there was light associated with gravitational waves for the very first time. Never before have we, have we seen these two messengers, light and gravity, work hand in hand. And in just a couple of seconds, there was this chirp from, the gra from two neutrons are smashing into each other, and then a delay one, of 1.7 seconds, and then this blip, which is again just a two second long firework, right? It's the shortest but the ha most energetic flash of fireworks here in the gamma rays. And that was seen up in space. So let me tell you what this sounded like, right? Um, so you'll hear, an, a, a, if, you, if your ears are good, you'll hear a rumble. And when two neutron stars merge, then suddenly arithmetic doesn't help you, right? So you learned in kindergarten or maybe even before that, one plus one equals two. Uh, that one plus one equals two math just doesn't work. Because when two neutron stars merge, the sum is smaller than the, than the A plus B of the individual masses. In fact, 0 0.025 solar masses of material gets instantly converted into gravitational wave energy and thrown out into the universe into a spectacular explosion. And when black holes merge, they're pretty short-lived. You see something for a couple of seconds. When neutron stars merge, you hear something with the advanced gravitational wave interferometers for about 100 seconds. And do you see that rumble? That's what all the excitement was about, OK? <laughs> so, so LIGO in gravitational waves operates these four kilometer long interferometers. They are the most exquisite precision um, physics experiment uh, that, uh, that I know of. And my colleagues just across the street in the physics department um, have built this magnificent instrument that can hear this very, very quiet sound on a very, very noisy Earth. Um, so I told you this was about two neutron stars. And neutron stars are about the mass of the sun. Some can be a little bit less. Some can be a little bit more. Um, so all the excitement, the Nobel Prize in physics just uh, a few days ago, all that was about black holes, about 30 solar mass black holes merging into each other and forming close to 60, but not quite 60, solar mass black holes. So that's these blue things here. This here is the astrophysical population of neutron stars. And neutron stars are just the dead cores of massive stars. They're actually already dead stars, even when they start, start out. So looking at, looking at what, is, what is normally you can think of as a graveyard of stars, 
and two stars here, these two orange dots, smashed into each other and built a more massive thing. And I call it thing because we don't really know what it made. Did these two neutron stars smash into each other and form the heaviest neutron star that we've ever seen? Or did these two neutron stars merge together and form the lightest, wimpiest black hole that we've ever seen? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think anybody knows right now. Some people have guesses. But what will truly tell the answer to this is the next generation of gravitational wave interferometers that can detect these signals to even higher precision. But that's OK. We can live with you know, something that was in between a neutron star and a black hole and leave that mystery for uh, you know, something to do for you know, keep jobs uh, in this field. We can't do, do it all with one event. Because even with just one event, I mean, the kind of physics that you can, you can learn is amazing. Um, this here is a list of physics that got Professor Alan Weinstein super excited and he went over the moon with this list about how we could test Einstein's theory of general relativity, actually measure the gravitational rays that are in fact moving at the speed of light, start to constrain the cosmic expansion of the universe we live in, and so on and so forth. But that's all, that's all sound, right? I mean, that's just the burp, um, the chirp. Yeah. The place where um, I get to really excited and get really, really um, interested in this object is trying to find the home of the merger. Okay? So um, I showed you three gravitational wave interferometers. You could see that, that, that swinging curve in two of them, but nothing in the third one. But sometimes a non-detection can do more for you than a detection. Because when, when you're trying to figure out where a sound comes from, imagine this is a completely dark room and somebody claps. Right? and you're trying to figure out who clapped. It would help if your ears had multiple directions. And Virgo, which is an Italian interferometer, given that it didn't detect it, it meant it had to be in one of its nulls, one of the few places where it wouldn't have seen it. Because it, it should have heard it, it was sensitive to, to hearing it, but it didn't hear it. So that reduced the area on the sky, instead of this big banana, to this little tiny region in the sky, which was about 30 square degrees. OK? So 30 square degrees, this was the smallest, most narrow region that gravitational waves had ever localized a signal to. But what does 30 square degrees mean? You all know what the full moon is, right? The full moon is about half a degree on the sky. So when I say 30 square degrees, I mean 10 full moons by 12 full moons. It's about 120 full moons on the sky. That's not small, right? In that big area in the sky, I wanted to find that one galaxy, that one point in, the star, in, in it that actually had the merger. So that's when the astronomers got to work in finding home, right? So we peered inside that banana, and what we found was that there were only 49 galaxies in that error circle. When my postdoc did this cross match to his you know, very fancy census of the local universe galaxy catalog, and there was only 49 galaxies, I thought he'd made a mistake. This was, it was, it's usually thousands and thousands of galaxies. But 49 is spectacular. It's a very, very small number. And what he did was reverse sort this list by stellar mass. The more massive the galaxy, the more stars it has. So the more likely it is to be the home of the merger. And this galaxy here, NGC 4993, was home. And let's find out how that search happened. So here at Caltech, um, we are sort of model agnostic. You know, people have ideas about what things should look like even before they're seen. Uh, we sort of, you know, take, take, don't take that too seriously. Uh, we just take that at face value. And we decided to start a search for the electromagnetic counterpart at just about every wavelength we possibly could. Okay? So what we first did was we began a hard X-ray search. Now, we, we had a galaxy catalog, 49 galaxies to search. That's a very doable search. So with this satellite here, the new star satellite, we started looking for hard X-ray photons at the very high frequency end of the electromagnetic spectrum. And we started marching down the galaxy list. This is all minutes after getting that trigger. Early in the morning, we're still on August 17th, 2017. Minutes later, the SWIFT satellite started both a soft X-ray and an ultraviolet search. So ultraviolet are the bluest photons, um, are very, very blue hot photons here. Is, uh, so, uh, and then we began a search in the infrared with the Gemini South Observatory. 
And then in the radio, my colleague Greg Hallinan uh, began a search with a very large array. Okay, so you'll see that uh, this spans almost the entire electromagnetic spectrum. There's one wave band missing, optical, right? So the optical was easy because all I had to do was call up my friends at Carnegie Observatories and share with them my list of galaxies. And, and they, they promised me that at last Campanas Observatory with their four beautiful telescopes in Chile, they had the optical part of the spectrum covered. So I trusted them with that, and it was really good that I did because a few minutes after sunset in Chile, just 10 hours after the event, my colleagues at Carnegie Observatory, and Maria is sitting here and can answer more questions about how the night unfolded that day, uh, they found this, this dot of light next to NGC 4993, the third galaxy in my list. Okay, they didn't have to go very far down that list. It was just the third galaxy out of 49, right? And they saw this beautiful flash of light that they published in this, in this paper. And this is when, you know, the, the search got even more spectacular. Because in my opinion, the most majestic aspect of this, this search was that it lit up in every single wave band. So we, you saw the optical photons there, but Hours later, it was shining in the infrared, in the ultraviolet. The radio was a very, very long wait. It was, for two weeks, there was nothing. And then it lit up in the radio, in the x-rays. So every single wavelength in the electromagnetic spectrum shown for this one firework. So this was an absolutely spectacular fireworks display with colors across the entire spectrum. It just couldn't be better than this. Um, and then this one dot, this is the UV dot, the infrared dot, the radio dot, is what every, every astronomer in the world who has a telescope even in their backyard or their favorite mountaintop uh, got to work on. So what you see here is a movie now of 77 zero telescopes over, spread over seven continents. There are only seven continents, okay? And then there were seven telescopes in space. Everybody was just stopped, all telescopes dropped whatever they were doing. And they said, we are going to go and look at this position to try and characterize this firework before it disappears on us. Because as I told you, these fireworks just last for a very short time. So you have to drop everything that you plan to do with your telescopes and instead go and point to that one dot and collect as much data, as much information as you possibly can. So here you see telescopes around the world. Uh, red is optical and infrared telescopes. Green is radio telescopes. And as, as the days went by, more and more data was collected by astronomers all over the world. In fact, I think it was 3,500 astronomers or so, which is everybody who does time to be in astronomy. Now, in this uh, movie runs for a while. We can come back to it if you're interested. Um, but in this um, magnificent uh, uh, search, I had the luxury of leading a, a, a project called Growth the global relay of observatories watching transients happen. So it really helps in this sort of game to have friends and telescopes spread o across the world. Because, okay, if you have telescopes spread across the world, that's easy, right? You see, if I have a telescope at Palomar observing and the sun rises, the sun gets into the way of collecting those, that data. But I can just jump west because in Hawaii, it's still night when it's already morning here, right? So I can keep collecting data from Hawaii and then go to Japan, and then Taiwan, then India, then uh, Spain, so on and so forth, right? So I can build this ring of telescopes around the world that collect the data. And that's fantastic. So a network of, of telescopes can beat sunrise. And sun is, you know, the nearest and very important star, by the way. But it just gets in, in the way of studying cosmic fireworks sometimes. Uh, but another really, really important thing about having a group of friends around the world to work with is that the team never sleeps. The last two months, I'm an all-time low in terms of sleep, very sleep-deprived here. But the best thing is that we can just keep working continuously to study and characterize this discovery. But the real powerhouse of the growth network, which is a partnership in international research and education, are the young people. And you, and you hear from some of these young people in the panel uh, that follows. Here are some pictures of them. So uh, the growth network had 18 telescopes spread over six continents. Um, there's no way I could reduce all that data or even make sense of all that data as it came in. So each of my students and postdocs took ownership of one telescope and one instrument. And as soon as the data came in, they would reduce it, analyze it, make sense of it, 
and then prepare for the next observation with that telescope. So these young people really are the heart of the project here and doing everything that I'm, I'm telling you about here. So what did we see? Okay, let's start getting to the science. Um, so this here is a scientific plot that we call a light curve. This is how the light evolved as a function of time. This is a complicated plot. The only thing I want you to take away from it is that the blue lines, they sort of drop like a rock in a few days. And the red lines, they glow for you know, a few weeks. This is about 20 days, three weeks. Okay? So what I want you to take away is, is a picture, actually, not all these dots, which is that there was a blue dot. Initially, there was a blue flash because it disappeared very quickly on you. And then there was a long-lived red glow or red shine that lasted for a few weeks. And the red shine hasn't yet gone away. 43 days after the merger, it's quite spectacular. This is very, very long-lived for, for an event as catastrophic and cataclysmic as this one. But 43 days after the merger, after it was out of reach from all ground-based telescopes, we detected the reddest infrared light pos that we have sensitivity to today, which is with the Spitzer Space Telescope. This is one of NASA's four great observatories um, that's in its final stretch. It's, it only has another year to go before it gets uh, shut down. Um, and this, this magnificent observatory detected this little red dot here, which is the last remaining extremely red photons, infrared photons, um, from this uh, neutron star, neutron star merger. So the infrared is where all the astrochemistry is. So why, what do we learn from, from looking at these dots? And you know, what, what, what do we learn? Right? That's the question. So this here is a very, should be a very familiar picture. This is a periodic table. And, uh, and basically, one of the questions that astronomers want to answer is where do all these elements in the periodic table come from? Right? So what we know, and we've known for a long time, is that hydrogen and helium are formed in Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Then the cores of stars fuse helium into carbon, uh, nitrogen, oxygen, all the way up to iron, after which fusion is just not efficient. Um, so you form a little bit of other elements there. Um, and then when these stars explode as supernovae, you see these elements shaded in blue, depending on the flavor of the supernova. But the embarrassing fact is that on August 16th, 2017, the day before this event, we didn't know where half the elements in the periodic table, the ones that are marked in yellow here, we had no idea where in the universe they're synthesized. Okay. <laughs> And we know the elements exist, right? I mean, many of you are married here. You know, you might have worn a golden wedding ring, right? Gold, platinum, uranium, neodymium. Some of you build infrared lasers. We use those infrared lasers in the LIGO experiment. We just didn't know where they're, where they're synthesized in the universe. They didn't come out of magic onto Earth, right? They must be made, manufactured somewhere out there in a cosmic mine. And we didn't know where that was. And that's because um, in terms of the chemistry, there's a process called the R process. R stands for rapid, OK? So this is a process by which you need to rapidly capture neutrons onto the core of, a star of uh, the nucleus to build heavier and heavier elements. And so far, supernovae just didn't make enough of the stuff. Even if they made a tiny bit, it was just not enough. We see a lot more heavy elements than supernovae can synthesize for us. So theorists, even decades ago, said, you, have to, you just have to wait. You know, one day, you'll see neutron stars merge. And that will tell you where our process actually happens. Because they're neutron stars. They're packed with neutrons. So you have an abundant supply of neutrons in, a, in highly, extremely violent conditions, so extreme, con extreme temperature, extreme density. And our process nucleosynthesis, this rapid capture of new free neutrons, can easily occur. Right? It's in almost inevitable. But I'm an observer, you know, theorists are great, but I don't believe it until I see it. And, uh, you know, when my graduate student, uh, Jacobs Jenkson, first showed me the spectrum, I couldn't believe my eyes. So this now is taking that infrared dot and, and trying to make a rainbow out of it. So taking the light and dispersing it through a prism. This is what we call spectroscopy in astronomy, where we are trying to get the chemical thumbprint of the explosion. And you know, these are just a bunch of squiggly lines, but I can't tell you how exciting these squiggly lines were. Because you see these two bumps. These two bumps, I've seen many a spectra in my scientific career so far. 
but just never anything like it. And it's not just me. I mean, no astronomer has ever seen anything like this before, which has these two bumps. Because these two bumps are a clear signature. So black is the data, and red is the model from four years ago from uh, theorist Dan Kaysen and Jennifer Barnes at UC Berkeley. And the bumps, even without doing anything, just overplotting them, match up. So you see bumps in exactly the place you would predict if, in fact, these heavy elements were being synthesized in large quantities into neutron star mergers. And then the sequence of evolution of these bumps looks something like this. So working with um, Elena Pian and the European Space Observatory VLT Exuter exp exp uh, instrument, we were able to get a sequence of spectra. So you can see time tick, and you can see these bumps and wiggles go up and down. That's the treasure trove of information we have to work with. And what this means, what these bumps and wiggles mean, is that something like at least 10,000 Earth masses, actually more like 16,000, depending on exactly what assumptions you make, but certainly more than 10,000 Earth masses of heavy elements was being synthesized in this one neutron star neutron star merger. That is a lot, right? If you could mine it, you'd be rich. So, <laughs> so what does this mean, right? What is 10,000 Earth masses? Is that enough? Is that, can that explain the, the amount of uh, heavy elements that we see, the amount of gold and platinum that we see around us in the solar neighborhood? And the answer is actually yes. I mean, it's, it's so much that even if neutron star neutron star mergers only occurred once per 10,000 years per galaxy, that's two orders of magnitude redder than supernovae, uh, that's good enough. That's enough to explain the observed uh, abundances on, uh, in the solar neighborhood. So it's not just Earth site, but it could be very well be the site of heavy element formation. And the future is bright. Okay, and I, I, I very much mean that pun. I'm dead serious here. Okay? Bright as in laden with photons. Every time we see neutrons and neutron star mergers, merger, perhaps even when we see neutrons are black hole merger, we should see this bright shining flash of light, literally sparkling with, with gold and platinum and uranium and neodymium, or whichever element on the periodic table that, that suits your fancy. So I have a dream, uh, which is to build a really wide field infrared camera because infrared is where all this action is, maybe even in the South Pole uh, to do this right. But let me show you. show you the movie again, but without sound, um, so you can actually try to understand what this is all about, right? So I'm going to take all this data across many, many different wavelengths and try to put it together into one simple picture for you, okay? So you see two neutron stars circle come closer and closer and closer to together, right? And eventually they merge, but you can see they're throwing out a lot of stuff. So even before they merge, there's a lot of stuff around them. So when the jet launches and, and launches these gravitational waves, right there in that moment here, and I'm going to pause there so you can see it again, this is the moment, right? Because you see the two neutron stars merge and launch a jet. There's a big problem. This jet is having a very hard time getting out of the material. There's lots of stuff around it. So the jet is not alone. In fact, it carries with it this cocoon. You see this pink purple stuff? That's a cocoon of material that engulfs the jet, that comes along for the ride. Maybe the jet doesn't even make it out. But this cocoon of material, this very wide angle material that's around it, gets accelerated to very high velocities. And when that cocoon breaks out, you see some very wimpy gamma ray emission. And when this cocoon goes and interacts with the interstellar medium, uh, this here is all the gold and platinum, the blue to red light. And when the cocoon interacts with the interstellar medium, that's when you see the radio and X-ray emission light up. So for those of you who are a little bit more interested in this, this is a now hydrodynamical simulation. That was just a beautiful movie made by NASA. This here is the real physics here. 
So on the left, you see energy density. On the right, you see velocity. But it's the same concept. It's the jet launching, all the material around it, forming this wide angle cocoon, and then that cocoon breaking out. And the breakout of the cocoon gives you what is a very, very, very weak gamma ray emission. And then the question becomes, what is the fate of the jet? Did the jet survive all this craziness? Or did the cocoon completely suffocate the jet? So that there's no jet left after all of this. And to answer that, uh, you need radio data. Because in radio data, a jet looks very different from a cocoon. This we can rule out already because we saw radio emission just 16 days after the event. So a whole bunch of radio telescopes around the world detected this faint dot, which got much brighter in the radio. And that radio emission is telling you that what we saw was not a gamma ray burst. So some of you may have heard that, oh, we've solved the mystery of gamma ray bursts. That's a myth. Because this was a very, very wimpy gamma ray burst. This burst was 10,000 times weaker than a typical gamma ray burst. And this is not an ordinary gamma ray burst, because we certainly were not looking down the barrel of the jet. Such a weak jet wouldn't even make its way out. We weren't even looking off axis, um, where you look just slightly against the edge of the jet. Because this can explain, explain the gamma rays, but it can't explain the radio. We couldn't even be looking too far off axis, because if you were looking too far off axis, you would, you would not be able to explain the gamma rays, even if you could explain the radio. So my point being that to build a self-consistent picture, you need something, something other than your canonical uh, gamma ray burst to do this. And this is too much data, but my point is that it's consistent with this simple picture of a cocoon. And what Dylan on the panel can, I hope, tell you a little bit more about is this observation where the size of the, the material expanding is very, very different. So this here is the solar system, and these are the three contending models, right? They look very, very different in size. And we can now, only now, start to measure the size. So a network of radio telescopes are trying to measure the size of the thing to tell us whether or not there exists a cocoon, whether the jet made it out or not. And this is the, the VLBI network. And I'd like to end by saying we've learned a lot just from one fireworks display and just in the last couple of months. But this is just the beginning. There are many, many questions that we still hope to answer. And it's just the beginning of what we call multi-messenger astrophysics. So if, if cosmic fireworks are for you, um, please stay tuned and ask lots of questions. Thank you. I'm happy to take a few questions, and then the panel can answer many more questions for you. So does anybody have any questions? Yeah? The, all the pictures are you know, the either black holes or the neutron stars coming together. The waves are going out on a plane, the same plane as they're orbiting. What do you see as you go up toward 100 degrees off that plane? Right. So in this particular case, um, it's actually we were something like 30 degrees off from the barrel of the jet. So uh, the ripple that's sent is in the fabric of space-time. So the, the signal that you see, the amplitude, the phase, the details, all very much depend on exactly how that line of sight was. Um, and whether you're looking straight down, 30 degrees, 90 degrees. But that ripple is, is three-dimensional. So, so you would see it no matter where you were. It would just look, the squiggles would look slightly different. That's all. Question back. That's a, that's a great question. So the gravitational wave uh, detection lasted for 100 seconds. So it saw the final dance of the neutron stars come closer and closer and closer together and ended right about at merger. We hope that the next generation of gravitational wave detectors, something like what Professor Rana Adhikari and other, uh, 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 other physicists are thinking about in the LIGO Virgo Consortium, that next generation of detectors should be able to see things after merger. And the waveform after merger would answer this question of whether or not you formed a black hole or, uh, or uh, a very, very light black hole or a very, very massive neutron star. Question, yes? What is all this uh, matter that's coming up out of the sky? 
Um, I think it's uh, a question of fundamental curiosity, right? I mean, we see gold around us. Don't we want to know where it's actually made? You know, that's beautiful. Um, but more practically, the kind of technology that, that's involved in something like this in the detection of gravitational waves in robotic telescopes, in detectors, cameras that can collect data from such a wide variety of, um, of wavelengths, that is something that could be very useful for reasons that we can't even think of right now. For example, something like GPS, I think you have astronomers to thank for that. And everybody uses GPS in their phone and, and cars now. Uh, that's not why we invented it, but, but I think it turned out to be pretty, pretty useful for you. So, uh, so we focus on answering fundamental questions and curiosity, but, but we do that with cutting edge technology, pushing the boundaries of technology, and uh, the consequences are, you know, there could be fun applications for the world. Uh, and we can't even imagine what they are right now. What's your best guess as to what the remnant was? Did it exceed the, the poverty limit? Uh, do you think it became a black hole? Or did it become a really big piece of stuff? Uh, I think it's anybody's guess at this point, right? Um, and uh, there's uh, nothing in fundamental physics that, that stops you from making a neutron star more massive than um, the fundamental limit is at 3.2 solar masses. This thing was about 2.7 solar masses. So fundamental physics doesn't tell you whether it was a neutron star or black hole. Um, it's very much in this gray zone where the physics could work for, being, for it being the most massive neutron star or the, the least massive black hole that we knew of, know of. Okay, question at the back. And uh, thank you for that question. For me, the, um, the place that's lacking right now and where we don't have the best, best um, instruments uh, in our arsenal is the infrared. Uh, the infrared detectors are very, very expensive because um, you can't use silicon anymore beyond one micron. So you need to go to other semiconductors. And that technology is just not mature enough right now to build very wide field infrared detectors. And that's something that I'm very actively pursuing, is how do I build a wider field infrared detector? In the optical, we have 50 square degree detectors. In the infrared, we don't even have a one square degree detector right now. So we're looking into possibilities using alternative semiconductors to try and break this cost barrier right now into exploring the dynamic infrared sky. Because in this question here, the infrared was key to answering this, whether or not heavy elements are synthesized. Um, I think I saw one more hand on the right here. Can you just take that one? Yeah. There's many a mystery yet. I think this is only the beginning. So, <laughs> uh, but I think the panel is eager to answer questions as well. So I'd like to hand off to the panel to take more questions, if that's okay. Yeah. Let's let's thank Dr. Monse Kaslewal for an excellent talk. Okay, thank you guys for your patience. Thank you for your patience. Uh, so what we're going to do now is the, the Q&A panel. Um, I've provided some, some labels for all the members of our panel who are either graduate students or postdocs or staff, um, either here or at Caltech or at the Carnegie Observatories on the other side of Pasadena, the north side of the 210. Um, so, uh, next to each person's name, if you can see, I provided a couple of topics that they, the, 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 uh, the expert is willing to answer questions on, just as like an idea of things to ask questions about. And I'll go through all of the people. But, and as a, after I introduce everyone, um, many of the people on this panel had uh, involvement with the discovery, which is why they're on it. I didn't have any involvement with the discovery. Uh, so I won't have an anecdote associated with it, but uh, some members of the panel would like to share like a, 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 an anecdote associated with what happened and the discovery as it took place. So first I'll go through everybody. Uh, we've got 
Jamie Rollins, he's a staff member here at Caltech working on the LIGO project. He's comfortable answering questions about LIGO, gravitational waves, and so on and so forth. Uh, Anna Ho is a graduate student here in Caltech Astronomy, and I mislabeled her, her chart. Um, I, stars and transient events, short-lived events like what we saw, she's comfortable. She's not comfortable answering questions about exoplanets, as I put here. But we can, we can still answer your questions about exoplanets. We'll manage, we'll manage, but... Um, uh, Maria is, uh, is, is staff, or postdoc, postdoc at, um, at the Carnegie Observatories and was involved in one of the, the first teams to optically image the, the, uh, the neutron star merger um, a couple of months ago. And she's comfortable answering questions about supernovae, stars, and observing, telescope observing, and so on and so forth. Keisha Lay is a graduate student in Caltech Astronomy uh, and also in, uh, one of Monsi's students. Anna was also one of Monsi's students um, working on all of this stuff. And so uh, Keisha Lay is comfortable answering questions about telescopes, radio observations, and neutron stars, compact objects. Um, Dylan, graduate student, Caltech Astronomy, star formation, radio astronomy, transients, and then I'm Cameron. I'm a postdoc here, and I can answer some questions about computers, simulations, universe, the space program, <laughs> unrelated to all of this. So um, I'll, for those of you who want to say an anecdote associated with the uh, discovery, I'll just hand the, the mic down. So do you want to say something first, Bill? Sure. OK, so I'll start. Um, first, I should preface this by saying that I was not actually personally involved in any of the follow-up. But uh, it was actually uh, quite cool hearing about this. I heard about this almost immediately after the actual discovery because my friends and I, uh, speci specifically uh, my friend Jake uh, and I, were driving up to go see the eclipse um, in like late August. <laughs> we're in the, you know, we're driving in the middle of the night in Utah, and Jake receives a call, and he's like, "Oh, that's weird. Monty's calling me. <laughs> Wonder what's up." <laughs> you know, normally Monty like respects my vacation time, <laughs> but you know, obviously this is the explosion of the century, and so. Uh, you know, he, he starts talking to her and uh, very rapidly it becomes clear that so there's something extremely exciting going on. And of course, he's not officially allowed to tell us anything that's going on, but you know, being the, the four of us are... <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I feel like everyone can sympathize with Jake, right? I mean, we're, we're all like bad at keeping secrets. <laughs> I certainly am the worst at keeping secrets. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you know, it, it, it was unavoidable just based on the things that, you know, he and Monty were talking about. Uh, you know, we all knew that, uh, you know, it was a LIGO event. And based on the fact that he was not allowed to tell us about it, you know, that, that tells you a lot when you're, you know, an astronomer. Um, yeah, so I, I've heard lots of rumors, like, throughout the process. I'm also a Greg Hallinan's student. Uh, and Greg was the first person to discover the radio afterglow of this. Uh, and so, you know, I, I'm working on a completely separate project, but, you know, getting a hold of Greg during this entire time, like these past two months, is an absolute nightmare. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I tried to, like, you know, camp outside of his office for a few hours and hoping to, like, talk to him for five minutes or, you know, bump into him, like, you know, when he goes to the bathroom or something like that. <laughs> um, but, yeah, you know, uh, he, he told me that... Uh, he stayed up basically for 24 hours straight just processing uh, radio data because, you know, it's, it's highly competitive trying to get the first detection. And he succeeded. And, you know, the, the radio afterglow of this event is still super bright. And, um, you know, it's still evolving. And it's going to teach us a lot about this event in the months to come. So is he, is he not sleeping this uh, whole time? Uh, Greg? Yeah, for basically he's not. Monty didn't sleep either, right? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody slept. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay, so um, uh, I was actually involved uh, in the team, so I can share my story. So I am Monty's student, and I don't really work on this stuff, but I work on broadly on transient. So um, on August 17th, I was not here. I was on vacation at home in India. And um, that's when I got this email from Manzi saying that, oh, do you, LIGO found a neutron star merger. You know, teams are now looking for the counterpart and so on. So the counterpart was found a few hours, uh, a few hours after the, the detection of the gravitational waves. And 
um, I remember you know, I got on this call you know, in, in the middle of my vacation, and there was this thing. Mansi asked me that, can you get um, radio follow-up from India? So it turns out that India has this very big radio telescope called the GMRT, which stands for the Giant Meter Wave Radio Telescope. And I did most of my undergrad working at GMRT, looking at various kinds of radio transients. So you know, we wrote up a proposal in two hours. And two hours is a really short time, because people spend months writing proposals. We wrote up one in two hours. And we submitted it. We were on sky in eight hours, which is a really short time. I mean, on sky, you know, from the first plan to actual execution, it was eight hours. So that was pretty amazing. Uh, I guess the really fun part was that, you know, because of the time zone gap be between uh, California and India. So remember at one point, so Mansi, please don't kill me for saying this, but <laughs> uh, at one point, um, it was like three in the morning in India, and I was sleeping on my vacation, and Mansi gives me a phone call. Uh, and I, I initially didn't expect that Mansi would call me up at three in the night. I was like, okay, <laughs> I picked it up. Um, the first thing I actually told her after I picked up the call was, how did you get my Indian phone number? <laughs> uh, but it turns out that she had digged it out out of the various emails that we had shared earlier. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's how the thing started. But I guess what really kept not only me, but the entire team really motivated to follow up this event, you know, keep sleep behind and do everything that we needed to, was just because of the possibility that this could be a potentially a once in a lifetime event. We might never see one of these events ever again. And that, I think, was really the motivation for me, as well as a lot of other people, you know, you know putting all our hearts out into following this event. So, yeah. Excellent. So, yes, my name is Maria Drought. I'm currently a postdoc at Carnegie Observatories. Um, and I was actually Skyped into the observatory in Chile when the optical counterpart was first discovered. So it was found with the Swope telescope, um, which is at Las Campanas. is a one meter there. Um, and I can say that this was absolutely the most hectic and crazy night of observing that I've ever been a part of. Um, it was one that after the detection was made by LIGO, we had about 10 hours until it was going to be sunset in Chile, and we knew we'd have an option to find this optical counterpart. So many members of the group were scrambling trying to prepare for that, and we also we knew because of where this patch on the sky was that Monty showed you, we knew that Chile would be the first place that would be able to find the optical counterpart, but that patch of the sky was only going to be up above the horizon for about an hour at the beginning of the night. So we had the afternoon to prepare, and then we knew we were going to have one hour worth of time in which to try and search and find this object. And as it turns out, um, because we're prepared and because of the patch of the sky it was in, um, it was possible. It was in, as Monty said, one of the first galaxies that were on these lists that people put together. And so it was about um, 10, maybe 15 minutes into the night when we first discovered the source. Um, so it happened very quickly, but of course you don't know right away that it is the source. Um, it could be anything. It could be an asteroid, it could be something else, it could be some other supernova that happened to explode. So we had to get a lot of other data, uh, both on that first night and over the following nights, to allow us to really say for sure that we had found the right thing. Many people figured it was just some random supernova. Um, but as, as several other people have mentioned, it was about to be the solar eclipse. <laughs> so many of us had plans already, and so I myself personally was driving from here in Pasadena to many of us at Carnegie. We're doing an outreach event up in Idaho um, several days later, and so I still went on that trip, um, driving up to Idaho, and then afterwards I was supposed to be taking a vacation, meandering my way through Utah on the way back, stopping at national parks along the way for the whole week back. And we still did that. We did not cancel the trip. But so this meant that I was, had this weird, re really weird vacation where I was half the time like totally out of human contact, like hiking through national parks in Utah. And the other half, as soon as we got back to the car, like tethering my cell phone or my computer off my phone, trying to frantically send emails to Chile to coordinate all the observations afterwards. So it was a very, very bizarre experience, but one that totally worked out in the end and was very happy to be a part of. Hey, I'm Anna Ho. I'm a third year graduate student here at Caltech. And I don't work on these LIGO events, but I am a student in the collaboration led by Monsi, and I study different kinds of violent explosions. But uh, by being in the collaboration, I had the privilege of being privy to the conversations and watching the team go through the surprise and the whole process of demystifying what, uh, what was going on. So I found out also when I was in the car on the way to watch the eclipse 
And so I spent many, many hours with my friend being kind enough to drive and me sitting like this uh, in the front seat with my phone like this, typing with the other hand, taking notes and writing down what people were saying because I knew that I'd want those quotes, uh, I'd want to remember <laughs> those quotes <laughs> long into the future. Uh, something that made a really strong impression on me as a student was seeing just how much of a surprise this was to all of these people who I thought kind of knew everything. <laughs> Um, there was uh, the first thing that I remembered when I heard about this uh, discovery was just at a dinner at a conference a couple months earlier one of my mentors saying I bet that LIGO will not find a single neutron star neutron star merger <laughs> and he said that with great confidence <laughs> I'm not gonna say <laughs> there were and then, actually many conferences in the months before this where people put down bets for how long it would be and most of them Monty included in some of these bets most of it was like 15 years 20 years until something like this happened certainly the merger plus the uh, gamma ray signal yeah and then similarly initially when we saw how bright this thing was there was then this idea that maybe this wasn't associated with the LIGO event at all and someone else said I bet right now this is just a regular vanilla type 1a supernova yeah. <laughs> I also want to say who that was. And I, the, both times, you know, these, these very knowledgeable people were saying these things. I thought, oh, yeah, they're pro they must be right. They must be right. And it all turned out to be totally wrong. So um, as a student, that was really, it was fun. It was fun to watch. To watch. <laughs> Mother Nature does not care what you think. <laughs> so we had, in LIGO, we had been trying to keep all of this a secret, but clearly... That was completely irrelevant. It didn't matter. All of these people had nothing to do with it. All knew the day one what was going on. Um, yeah, it's very it's gratifying and sort of um, amusing to me that I, I've been working on LIGO for a very long time. And I actually did my PhD dissertation on one of the first um, analysis pipelines that was trying to detect gravitational waves in very low latency so that we could, for the express purpose of triggering telescopes. And back then, the, uh, on LIGO, we were just kind of toiling in obscurity on this thing. Um, and in fact, we used to get a lot of grief from astronomers because they thought that we were taking their money <laughs> and not, you know, basically taking resources away from them. And we were all like, no, you guys will, you guys will rue the day. We'll show you. <laughs> and then now it's, it's incredible to see the, um, the uh, you know, response. And I'm, I think it's funny that this notion that this is a once-in-a-lifetime thing because this is just, I mean, this is the first neutron star detect, binary neutron star detection. And this is what we saw. And this, and everything that we've seen is because of LIGO. And I have no doubt, I mean, I also didn't expect, we didn't expect that our first BNS detection would trigger such a massive, you know, that we would also see coincident gamma rays and optical follow-up. But, you know, we've, in LIGO, we've been preparing to do this whole process for, you know, so I did my, I defended my dissertation in 2010, and in our last science run in initial LIGO, which was in 2009, was the first science run where we exercised these low latency pipelines and actually had our first astronomical partners with whom we shared our triggers. And, um, I think actually, if I remember correctly, that my analysis pipeline was the first one to actually trigger an optical follow-up, which I thought was very cool. But of course, it was our, our, we didn't actually make any detections at that time, and we had set our threshold for sending out um, alerts to the telescopes kind of high, so that we could basically just to exercise this process. And so that was in 2009. And um, anyway. We've been preparing for this for a long time. And we, we didn't expect that the, the first BNS detection would be the one, you know, this crazy thing. But, you know, there's going to be a lot more of these. This is definitely not the first one. I mean, the LIGO sensitivity is only getting better. We're, we're taking a break right now where we're improving the sensitivity by um, 
like 50% or so, we're going to have a lot further, you know, about twice the range which we have now. Um, and of course, the entire astronomical community is going to be primed. You know, all of these, all of these low threshold gamma ray events. You know, this this gamma ray event was something that happens frequently, but it was always considered unremarkable because it was just this very low sort of low threshold event. But because of the fact that it had this LIGO trigger associated with it, then everybody was like, holy crap, that's, this is something really big. So all of these low threshold gamma ray triggers may in fact indicate that there's a population of these things that may be, you know, if we start looking for them, we'll start to see them more. But we'll see, what, what, we'll see how much LIGO is able to see these things in the future which is hopefully a lot more. Yeah, I just wanted to add one thing to that, and then we can actually go to your question. <laughs> um, but just, yeah, that there are actually um, many of these sort of low threshold gamma ray detections that happen, but often it's been thought that they probably were just very far away, and that's why they were faint. But what LIGO really gave us on this was it told us that this was actually very close by. And so it's possible that there is actually a large population of these low luminosity GRBs that hadn't really been probed before. And so I also think it's just the beginning. I will say, though, we did get very fortunate with this one. For instance, um, LIGO itself turned off like a week after this happened. Um, it really was at the very final portion of the science run. And the optical as well, I told you how it was only visible for the f last or the first hour of the night that we were observing in Chile. And that was getting shorter every single night. So by the end of the three to four weeks um, from ground-based telescopes, you were only observing it for maybe half an hour each night. If this thing, which exploded or merged um, you know, 150 million years ago had merged a month later, we wouldn't have seen it. So that's just a fun well, way to but, think. But we, yes, but we will, you know, we, we, so people, people get confused about, I'm not saying you're confused about this, but we, people, people, we get questions about this, about why we do this, like why aren't, why did we turn it off, okay. right? Right, and the reason, th this is an important point, because um, the, we, what we do is we observe for, say, six months or six months to a year, um, something like that, and then we turn off our detectors and try to make the sensitivity better. And you, one might ask, why don't you just leave the detectors on and detect more events? Well, the reason is that if we can make the sensitivity better, what we're detecting, the sensitivity, what we call our sensitivity, is essentially how far away we can detect an event. And that is the, the radius of a sphere. And the sphere, the volume of the sphere, is the cube of the radius. So if you can increase the radius by a factor of two, you've increased the volume by a factor of eight. And so that is essentially like increasing your event rate by a factor of eight. So if you go off if you, if you detect one event in a year, if you were to observe for two years, you'd have two events. If you observe one event in a year, you go off and you increase your sensitivity by a factor of two, then in that next year, you're going to have eight events. So yes, we would have maybe missed this event, but chances are that when we turn back on, we will see probably eight of these events in our next science run. It doesn't mean that they're all going to have this, this crazy, you know, these gamma rays associated with it and this crazy optical follow-ups. But the, the point is that this is, this, the fact that LIGO is now exists and is able to give us these early warning of these triggers where we know exactly what we're looking at. We're seeing a binary neutron star coalescence and we know really where it is in the sky and how far away it is, it's a whole new game. It's a whole new game for astronomy now. I think it really, it kind of sends, sends shivers down my spine thinking about it because it's really going to change what happens in astronomy in, from here on out. I, I feel very strongly about this. And I've dedicated my life to this, so I'm like, about damn time. <laughs> so anyway, I think it's really cool. I think it's really cool, and the excitement in the astronomy community associated with this is really, really, really cool. And it's very, very exciting. Yeah. Uh, that's 
a good question. I basically, oh, sorry. Um, the, the question is, um, we've seen one binary neutron star event, and does that revise our estimates of the rate of binary neutron star events? Um, I'm maybe not the best person to ask about that. I don't know if anybody else studies neutron star populations. But, but basically, I, I think it, it excludes some pessimist, very pessimistic models. But we, we, we were OK with not detecting binary neutron stars just yet. So we, we, hadn't, we hadn't felt like we were um, we, we, we hadn't gotten to be really worried that we were not seeing binary neutron stars yet. We, like, basically, we were expecting if we got you know, another couple of factors of two in sensitivity then, and we still hadn't detected something, then that would be really weird. But yeah. yeah, I would say similarly, the rates before spanned you know, several orders of magnitude in their uncertainty. So huge error bars. Huge error bars. So, there have been updated rates both from LIGO side and several on the astronomy side based on the detection of this event. And I would say also then those are still based on an N equals one. So it, it, nothing's in disagreement yet. So you can drive slightly different rates, but it's sort of still well within the range of what we thought so before. Let me make one additional comment on that. The, the thing that's really funny for LIGO is that even though the neutron star binary event rate is, it has these big error bars, the black hole binary event rate had even bigger error bars. And so we had no idea how many black holes we were going to see. And so in the whole history of LIGO, we had been basing our, um, our you know, how good, how well we were doing on how many binary neutron stars we were going to see. That's how we measure, in fact, that's how we still measure the sensitivity of the detectors is the binary neutron star range. The range... How, how, how far away can we see one of, these, one of these binary neutron star mergers? And then we turned on the detectors, and all of a sudden we were seeing black hole mergers all over the place. And that, was, that definitely revised our estimate. I mean, obviously, we've, we've got much better estimates about how, much, how frequently these binary black hole mergers are. But um, it's just funny that, you know, the, the range for the binary black holes went from zero to thousands a year, we had no idea about that. And even though the, the binary neutron star rate error bars was, was, is still big, it was a lot less than the binary black holes. There, um, yeah, the, the question is about how long LIGO is going to be off, and if while we're off, are there going to be other detectors? So um, we're going to be off for about a year, and um, there are other detectors, but LIGO is very interesting. It's, it, it's, very, it's different from the rest of astronomy in a kind of interesting way, which is that we all work... the, the the whole group of detectors works as a network, as a single network. So the fact that we had LIGO, the two LIGO detectors and the Virgo detector, we're not competing with each other. There's no competition about who's going to be the first one. We all have to be looking at the same time because that's how we are able to localize where it is. We need all detectors running simultaneously, and we take the data from all detectors and analyze it simultaneously. So if we had enough detectors, then where, where each additional detector wasn't adding much to our ability to localize the signal, then we could stagger the, the um, upgrade process. But right now, we're, since we're still in these early phases and we only have a few number, we only really have these three detectors, we really want all of them to be working at the same time, because any one alone is not going to be able to provide much. We, 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 we're just sort of now getting to the point where we maybe could say with confidence that a single detector had detected a gravitational wave event. But until, you know, previously we basically required that two detectors make the 
make a detection before we would claim that it's a detection. So Japan is building a detector. We're going to build a detector. The LIGO project is going to build a detector in India, but those are not going to come online for more than five years. So until then, we're, we're going to really try to coordinate all of our observations. We're all discussing what we what we're trying to figure out the best answer to your question. Cameron knows about the universe. I think. Yeah. <laughs> so from these in particular, I mean, you mentioned it already that from when you have um, events that you have both gravitational waves and light from them, you can get an independent estimate of the Hubble constant or the expansion of the universe. Right now. The measurement from this was sort of right in the middle of other measurements, but it has a pretty big error bar on it. So with more events, you'd be able to get that more precise and pin things down. Um, similarly, I think there's going to be a lot that is learned still um, from this event, even in all the data, especially the radio and the X-ray data at later times about exactly what happened in this explosion. We understand a lot about the heavy elements that were synthesized, but there's still a lot we don't understand about this early emission and what that means for what physically happens, um, sort of the physics of what's going on with these neutron star mergers. I think when sort of LIGO and other detectors become more sensitive at higher frequencies, you'll also, as Monsi mentioned in her talk, learn a lot about during these mergers um, whether you form um, a black hole immediately or a neutron star that then collapses to a black hole or a black hole immediately, which will tell you a lot about the fundamental physics, or we call it the equation of state of neutron stars. So that's something that we very much can learn, maybe not from this event specifically, but going forward from events similar we, to it. We, we said some stuff about the neutron star collapse. Yeah, and it'll get even better as things go forward. Sure, okay, so um, just now I was looking at a picture that I took of Monsi's slide, or I guess uh, 
oh, one of the slides uh, from the press conference the day of. And I wanted to just, uh, th there are a bunch of tests of general relativity, for example, and that's another thing that you can learn about from this event. Uh, but I wanted to highlight two of them. Uh, one is that we saw the gravitational waves uh, within two seconds of the light itself. And because this happened, you know, 130 million light years away, right, this tells you that the speed of gravitational waves is exactly the same as the speed of light to within one part in 10 to the 15. Uh, and this is a prediction of general relativity and, you know, an exquisite test uh, and it holds true. And another amazing thing uh, is that there's a group of theorists at Caltech called the uh, Simulating Extreme Space-Time Collaboration that uh, does these uh, numerical simulations uh, solving all the equations of general relativity. And you can take, uh, you know, two neutron stars and you can merge them. Uh, and you can simulate what the signal of the LIGO would C looks like. Uh, and because neutron stars are uh, smaller than black holes, um, they, uh, y you can see them for longer, right? You saw that in Monsi's talk. Uh, all the black holes lasted for, you know, a few seconds, whereas I believe the neutron star merger lasted for like 100 seconds. Um, and you get something like 3,000 cycles uh, just up and down in the strain that LIGO sees. And if you subtract the best fit model from the simulation over these 3,000 cycles, it fits pretty much exactly. And so we really understand general relativity, and uh, it really works. Yeah. Uh, yes. So, does anybody want to take this? I, I, I mean, I can, I am not an expert on this at all, but yeah, there, there are some, um, so the question was about dark matter, can LIGO say anything about dark matter? And the thing about dark matter is that it's, we have no idea what it is, basically. So, there's been a lot of um, discussion about, so, for instance, could the black holes that we detect be part of the dark matter. That's one thing, because we, you know, those are things that we wouldn't have been seeing otherwise. They're black holes, they only, they don't, they're not emitting light, they're not, you know, they, they, do, they do interact electromagnetically in the sense that light falls into them, and they can affect what we see behind them, you know, through gravitational lensing. But they could, they could be dark matter. And then I heard of a paper that came out after this event just recently was were we talking about this last night the other the other night but they were talk somebody i guess was looking to see if there was a discrepancy um based on the travel time of the photons through the intervene through the intervening galaxy if that would account for um yeah no Actually, I'm thinking, maybe I'm confusing that. There was another paper that was talking about the weak equivalence principle to see if the, the, the light and gravitational waves, see any discrepancy between the light and the gravitational waves could tell us interesting things about, um, you know, how, how they interact with what is between us and the event. Um, I'm not giving you a very good answer, but because I, I don't know. Basically. <laughs> right. Yeah. So. It could. I mean, yeah, but it could. Um, it could. But we don't. But yeah, I, I certainly don't know enough about dark matter to be able to. to give you a really coherent answer. Yes, go for it.
Yeah, I mean, I would say that that's, I mean, we're fine-tuning the, the, our theories about how all this stuff works, right? The more information we get, the more we can, you know, really test the, the, the details in the theories. Um, well, I guess I'll try to, uh, the, <laughs> the, um, so the, the, the theory, the theory, the theory of electromagnetism fits into this overall theory called the standard model of physics. And that theory is very well understood. And then the theory of gravity kind of sits outside separate from that. And we've been having a really hard time reconciling those two theories in, 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 in sort of the, in the details. And so it's unclear how much we can really say about that in, with these kinds of detections. But there is one thing that I'm very curious about is that black holes in particular can potentially tell us a lot about that because black holes are so weird and we have so little idea about what's actually going on like inside the black hole and around the event horizon. There's weird stuff happening there that could help us resolve that issue. And so one thing that I am very hopeful for, I don't have any idea how this could actually happen, I'm not a theorist, but I have this like real dream that LIGO could somehow get sensitive enough that in these black hole mergers we could detect some really weird you know little squiggle in the signal that would tell us something really unexpected about what's happening when the black holes emerge that could tell us about this unification between these things but that's like a total this is like my total pipe dream about what LIGO could do because it would be so cool. But yeah, I don't know how exactly how that would happen because I don't know enough about these, these, these theories about this weird stuff that goes into black holes. But I, I noticed that our physics colloquium next week is going to be on this topic, which I'm super excited about. So. This is a good question. Um, so this is a great question. Um, as it turns out, uh, this was pretty standard for um, where we think neutron star mergers should happen. So as Monzi pointed out, several ways in which this gamma ray burst was weird, but there are types of gamma ray bursts, short duration gamma ray bursts that people also have thought for a long time were the result of neutron star mergers, and one of the large pieces of evidence for that was their host galaxies and where they were located. So in particular, in galaxies like this and relatively far offset. And the reason for that is you need a binary neutron star. So neutron stars come from supernova explosions. So each of those two stars at some point went through a supernova, and as you have a binary that's in that situation, when the explosion happens, you can actually kick the entire system. So the entire system gets thrown out at like a few hundred kilometers a second, and then the second explosion happens too, it gives a little kick, so the system is flying out, and so often you'll end up with them at slightly larger offsets from their host galaxies. So it actually was pretty, pretty typical, and there are actually many of the short duration gamma ray bursts are found at even further offsets than this one. This was actually relatively close into its galaxy in comparison to some of the other ones. It certainly helped us to discover it, though. If it had been right in the center of that galaxy, it would have been much harder to see by eye. Some image subtraction software would have still found it, but it would have taken a little bit more time. The question was, can the Doppler effect be detected in gravitational waves? I'm looking at the, uh, the Kibbe photo. <laughs> <laughs> he 
he's giving a thumbs up, so. Yeah, so, so I think that, yeah, we, I think we, so actually, well, I, I'm going to let Leo answer this question. <laughs> Yeah, as Mahansi is saying. Yeah, and we measure that the stuff that creates this very blue light that Mahansi is talking about, it was thrown out at something like 30% the speed of light or so. And no, it's not actually. It's, but no, it's okay. It's, it's a very good question, but it was not specifically in this case. Yeah. <laughs> Some of us are good. <laughs> um, I guess in terms of the neutrinos, uh, the detectors definitely looked, and there were actually a few alerts at various points throughout this through the internal circulars um, with tentative detections, um, and there are papers published with constraints now. Um, there are not definitive detections of neutrinos from this particular one. I'm not actually up to date on how constraining those limits are. Yeah. It was my understanding that the, the neutrino flux that was predicted for this sort of event was high locally, but, but we didn't necessarily expect that there'd be a lot of neutri neutrino flux at the distance that we are. So I believe that the, essentially the lack of substantial neutrinos that are passing through the detectors on Earth is not like, oh, oh crap everything's wrong, all of our models are wrong. I think it's all self-consistent. It was far enough away that we didn't expect to get a huge neutrino flux from this. Um, just to add on to that, so it turns out that um, like just after the first circulars from LIGO were released, there was a neutrino detection coincident in time with the gravitational wave trigger, which I think got most of us astronomers even more excited. But it turned out eventually that, so neutrino detectors have this can do this very coarse localization of where the neutrino came from. Um, so even though there was a detection which was coincident in time, it eventually turned out that it was spatially away from what we were ex from where we were expecting the signal to be. So it was eventually ruled out. But yes, that was you know another hard skip moment for a lot of astronomers when you see gravitational waves, a gamma ray burst, and neutrinos from the same source. That that would have been like you no know, a perfect world where yeah. astronomers get everything. But no, that wasn't the case. The neutrinos were unrelated. Yeah, the, I mean, eventually I think we will get all three at once. But the, um, 
it's also there was the 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 neutrino event was sort of coincident and there's a lot of very similar events like that during a day so it's so once you look a little bit closer it's like uh, it was, and then everybody was like i oh, forget it that's not actually that's just random so yeah it was a little bit disappointing i was also very excited when 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 people were saying that but then when we looked closer it was like ah there was no coincidence how far away was it from us 40 megaparsecs which is basically 120 million light years which is pretty close in the grand scheme of things Uh, so the question was about City of Astronomy. Last year, this week or so, uh, we had something called City of Astronomy for Pasadena where the mayor asked various different institutions to showcase the fact that astronomy has a rich history here in Pasadena between the Carnegie Observatories and Mount Wilson and Caltech and the Planetary Society and uh, IPAC, JPL, um, the Giant Magellan Telescope, 30 meter tiles tel telescope, a variety of different things. Institutions are here, um, arguably the most in the world for a small region here. And uh, the question is about why aren't we doing it this year? Uh, the the short answer is we burned ourselves out a little bit in organizing last year. But uh, I think there will be a series of events that are going on related to this in June of next year. It's not going to be an annual thing, but um, there will be public lectures. There will be a series of different astronomy on tap, like s consecutive astronomy on tap, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday events. Um, there will be a festival out uh, next to the Paseo and that sort of thing. So it will happen again. It's just not going to always be at the same time. Uh, that would be great. I mean, we, we actually have been sort of, I mean, we. Some people have been trying to pursue private funding stuff. So um, our funding is okay, is okay for a while. I mean, we've been guaranteed funding um, to run through the next uh, five years, I think. And then we've also got we're also going ahead with building this new detector in India and that a, a lot of that is actually being funded by the Indian government so that's that's good and that's that's going forward um, we're we have been having a little bit of trouble getting you know we I don't know how much I should get into these details but we're, we're trying to there we had our funding cut actually a little bit after the detection, which made, which we were like, what the hell? We just had like the greatest physics discovery of the century. Why are you cutting our funding? And I don't, I don't know why. Yeah, right. That, I mean, that was one thing. It was like, well, you've done it, so we're, we're done, right? Um, and so, in fact, the 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 mucky mucks in LIGO are going to the NSF at the beginning of November to reapply and to ask that we get the funding that was promised us and um, actually a little bit more because we say, you know, look, this is a, we, ne we need more money to operate at the level which we, which we all want to operate at. So, um, yeah, we're, we're first trying to get back the money that they took away from us, which is not that much. I mean, we can still, we, we're still going to be able to operate, but it's sort of at a reduced scope. I mean, the, the LIGO project for a long time, you know, was the only game in town in terms of doing gravitational wave observation. And so it, it's, this whole thing is evolving, right? So, the, so one thing is like, should, should the LIGO laboratory, the thing that has, the, the group that has built these, and uh, runs these two observatories, should they be the ones that are um, doing the R&D for the next generation of detectors? From our perspective, 
that's obvious because we're the ones who know how to make these detectors. So we're the ones who are, we're the ones who are doing the R&D for them right now. And so if you take away, and a lot of us are in the LIGO laboratory, so it doesn't really make sense from our perspective that you take away money from the LIGO laboratory to do R&D for how we push this whole field forward and make us all go back to the NSF and say, give us you know, a separate grant for doing R&D you know, it's just sort of like, you know, why do we have to go th jump through these hoops? But, um, the, you know, the big question now is, what are we going to be able to do next? We've got this f funding to get the, de the current detectors up to the design sensitivity, which we're still got qu quite a ways to go. Um, and then, but we have ideas about how we can make it better, either in the facilities that we have right now, or by making new facilities. And ideally, we'd like to make new, f new detectors, like ones that have 10-kilometer arms or 40-kilometer arms. And there's a project that's looking to make a detector in space, which is called LISA. And that, that actually is going forward. Um, so yeah, it's complicated. But it, you know, this is a new, exciting thing. And the, the fact that this event it should be I mean, we all hope that it'll be a windfall for this field because we'll, we're, it's proof that there's so much exciting stuff in these detections. So, hope, yeah, we'll see what happens. Oh, that's a, the, that's a gr great question. Uh, do you have uh, 40 kilometers of <laughs> free land? <laughs> we, we, you know, we have, We've been looking, you know, we've been taking maps of the Earth and making a 40-kilometer L and basically just <laughs> doing a search over the whole map of the globe of where we could put it. And, but, you know, how useful is that? Because, you know, if it's, I mean, if it's in the middle of some country which is not friendly or something. Well... Puerto Rico is not quite big enough, actually. I think, but I mean, it, we're, we're mostly in the U.S. is where we would we would like to build it. But you know, Australia is a great place. But Australia, um, there's there's been a lot of discussion about w how we organize this next generation. If we do want to, if we want to make these really long, big detectors, you know, they're going to be billions of dollars. We're not going to be able. It's going to be an international collaboration. It's not going to be like LIGO, which, is, which was just an American, basically just an American um, project. So we're going to have to have a whole collaboration, an international collaboration. And, you know, the international collaboration may be able to foot a lot of the bill of building it in somewhere like Australia because they can't afford to just build it there on their own. Um, but, you know, Europe, Europe wants to build one in Europe. And they've been, they've been calling this, their proposal the Einstein Telescope. And they want to put it underground, because in, in, in Europe, you would have to put it underground, basically. Um, and uh, there's benefits to putting it underground also, but it also makes it more expensive. I just wanted to say something on the EM or astronomy side of it as well, because clearly they're building many more detectors on the gravitational wave side. Um, and Time domain astronomy is something that right now there are several new projects which will be coming online in future years. So you have things like LSST in the southern hemisphere, which will hopefully we think, and especially now that LIGO is detecting stuff, they will be open to us doing sort of target of opportunity um, things where we can tell them to go and point in a certain direction. Um, and there are many other surveys coming online, but there's a lot that we could do better going forward. Monsi mentioned better infrared detectors. Say some of this too. UV is another direction, but there's many more detectors that could come online um, that would help us in our ability to do this um, faster and better, in particular in many locations around the globe, so weather isn't an issue. One of those locations around the globe is right here. <laughs> <laughs> so, two and a half hours drive towards San Diego, and you'll be at Palomar. Has anyone here visited Palomar before? Uh, if you haven't, I highly recommend it. It's open to the public. You can see uh, what was the biggest telescope in the world for decades. Um, it is now still uh, a powerhouse of astronomy. The, uh, you can go camping, which, which I've done up there. It's beautiful. 
Um, but what I wanted to point out is that uh, Marie mentioned LSST is coming up, but there is a sort of pathfinder uh, for LSST, kind of a test bed that we're going to be able to deploy some of our, um, our some of our software and some of our strategies for LSST um, called ZTF, the Zwicky Transient Facility, and that's actually the camera was just moved to the mountain, and just the other day I was downstairs, like literally two days ago, and I was watching the robot arm exchange uh, filters. So this is about to come online, and so for the next three years or so, ZTF will be a really important part of following up these LIGO events. And unfortunately, this one was, this last one was a little too early for ZTF, but ZTF will be online for the next one. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, this is really important, like, it was, it was very tricky for us to, like, how do we describe this, the fact that the Italian telescope didn't see anything, <laughs> we were kind of worried about that, and so we actually rushed out a paper, so there was, we detected a binary black hole event um, five days before this event. And that was the first event that was actually detected in the, in the Italian detector. And so before we published this event, we wanted to rush out the paper on that event to say, look, this detector can actually detect gravitational waves. And then this event where that detector did not detect anything, but that's actually very important because of that blind spot. But each of the detectors has what, they, what we call an antenna pattern, which is the, you know, the sensitivity in any given direction. And so all of the detectors have blind spots. And then you combine them all together and you get an overall antenna pattern for the whole array. And we, there are, you know, there are areas where we're more sensitive and less sensitive, but there's no blind spots necessarily for, for the whole antenna array, basically. But, that, but it does, even though it didn't detect it, that basically, and it should have, this is like what Monsi was saying, it's, that's important because that actually helped con us constrain where it is to being basically in one of the blind spots of that it detector. Doesn't have to describe blind to both LIGO detectors. Correct. Not totally blind, that just maybe reduced. Yeah, we, I mean, we, if for new detectors, we just want them as far away as possible. We want it, like, all the detectors to be far away from each other in different angles and, yeah, you know. So there's no, like, a general idea of all of them. Ideally, you want something that's a little bit more Yeah, I mean, that's why, that's why, I mean, India, India's good because it's on the other side of the Earth, but it's still in the same hemisphere. You know, Australia would be great like South Africa would be great because then, you know, they're just, they're more oriented at different directions and, yeah, the, anything that's farther away and at different orientation is better at this point. The two LIGO detectors, interestingly, were built specifically so that their sensitivity patterns overlapped each other a lot because the goal of the two LIGO detectors was really first detection. We want to, we, we want to really make sure we, detect gravitational waves for the first time, because we've never seen them before. So the most important thing is to say that we've detected them, and we know that they exist, and we know we can do it. And so in that case, the two LIGO detectors were made such that their antenna patterns very highly overlapped each other, so that the signals would be consistent in the two, two detectors. So we would not have this situation where you would detect it in one LIGO detector and not in the other, because that would be, we wanted to have a strong signal in both detectors. So we will we'll sacrifice some portion of the sky where we'll have blind spots for the two LIGO detectors um, just so that we can be sure that when we do get an event, we, we have it in both detectors.
Intergalactic medium, yeah. Okay, so the question uh, is about an announcement that took place in the press about two weeks ago before the big business of this week. And you may have read it. It got picked up by the press recently. Um, and it said, we found 50% of the missing matter of the universe. Well, you have to be is a little bit skeptical when you read these press releases because people who put out press releases are you know the institutions associated with the science group and they put this out and they're trying to like make a big splash now that paper came out like a month ago and it's I mean it's a fine paper but it's not like oh we've solved it all we've we figured it out in the same way that you kind of get this sensationalist feeling when you read the newspaper article so uh, the claim that's made in the paper is we found all the missing you know 50 percent of the missing mass in the universe which isn't really true um, but the idea is that maybe you guys have seen these cool movies of, uh, of the universe evolving and it shows essentially you start out, oh this is pen is atrocious and you won't be able to see anything. Uh, you start out with um, low tech, yeah, chalk works. If there's chalk. <laughs> there is? Oh good, good. okay. Okay. Uh, so you see sometimes these big uh, simulations that show, and it starts out where the universe is really uniform initially, and then as it evolves, it, it, um, it, it clumps into like filamentary structures like this, and then you have galaxies that sit, lots of little galaxies along these filaments. Have you guys seen any kind of movies like this occasionally? Um, now these are usually computer simulations. It doesn't always look like a starfish here. Um, these are usually computer simulations, but they are consistent with the observations that we see when we look up in the sky. So people, let's say we're here, uh, and we look out in the sky, and we identify galaxies and their location relative to us and the speed at which they're traveling relative to us. We see the same patterns from the simulations in the locations of the galaxies in what are called redshift surveys because we're measuring the redshift to the different distances of the, of, the, of the galaxies. So this works. Like this is generally how the, how the universe evolves. It forms into these gravitationally bound structures and filaments and galaxies along those filaments. And then where the filaments intersect, you get clusters of galaxies. Like at this spot, you'd have lots of, lots of galaxies there. Now, but, but people have seen the distribution of galaxies along this, what's called a cosmic web, because it's kind of a web-like structure. But they haven't, seen, uh, they haven't seen a lot of the gas in between these, along these filamentary structures. And what w the discovery was is uh, there's a big survey called the Sloan G Digital Sky Survey uh, that observes lots of galaxies and things around the universe. And uh, what they were able to show is if you stack up a lot of these galactic observations against each other, you, a single observation doesn't allow you to see kind of the stuff in between galaxies, but if you stack a lot of them together, you can build up the signal in the same way that um, if you have a lot of faint images of something very dark of the same thing and you stack them all together and you co-add them together, you can see it much more clearly. Um, they, if you do this, then you start to be able to see <clears throat> evidence for, for material in between the galaxies themselves along these filamentary structures. So that's essentially what, what the result was. And it's consistent with what we, what we believed was there, but um, it's, it's kind of a, it's a good result. And, but it's, it's, I wouldn't call it, it's not solving the dark matter problem. That's exactly, exactly. It's, yeah, exactly. It's not even dark matter that it's detecting. It's detecting missing matter, which is to say this kind of low density gaseous component in between galaxies. So uh, it's great, but it's not amazing. 
and neither is my illustration. <laughs> and unfortunately, it's 10 o'clock. Uh, can I make a parting comment? Yes, you can make a parting comment. I, I just want to point this out because I've been thinking a lot about it, and it's so I think it's so cool. You could, you, you know, science can be this mysterious thing where scientists come up here and talk about complicated things, and you, you know, you have to trust us about all this crazy stuff that we're seeing. The gravitational waves was this thing that kind of felt like that because, you know, only these, only LIGO can detect these things, only the LIGO detectors. But then,